Hello again, and welcome to another episode of The Future of Sales. I'm your host, Sahil Mansuri, CEO of Bravado. And with me today is somebody that, uh, if you don't know who Dalius Wilson is, um, it is it is your own shortcomings in life that have led you to not know this wonderful human being. Uh, Dalius has become a dear friend of mine um, and is the VP of Sales at a company called GetAccept. Um, and uh, is one of the most well-known kind of thought leaders in the world of uh, sales today. Dalius, welcome to the Future of Sales. So excited to have you, man. Good to see you, brother. It's good. It's just like uh, our chats over dinner. It's uh, fantastic. Hopefully, everyone can grab a bite and join us as we peruse for the next half hour or so. <laughs> I think peruse is, is right, and, and certainly... Certainly food's a good idea. I hope everyone keeps their appetite after we nerd out about sales together over this. Um, yeah. All right, so the, the, the promise of the future of sales is authentic conversations with authentic sellers. And, and, and I would be remiss if I didn't give uh, the, our listeners or viewers an opportunity to at least meet you and to hear a little bit about your background. So maybe Dallas, if we can start there, that would be great. Fantastic. Well, I never dreamed of going into sales. In fact, the opposite. Uh, my father was uh, the VP of sales for HP for Asia Pacific. So I grew up listening to his calls and I was like, hell no, I'm not doing that. <laughs> and uh, actually, I tell this story a lot because he, he means a, a lot to me and I'll forward the, the link of this podcast to him so he can listen back home in Australia. But I remember... Um, he got very sick and, and before he went in for surgery, he actually took my hand and said, don't do sales. And, uh, and that was tough. It's always been tough, but at the same time, um, I, I really believe that sales is a pathway to influence the world and to influence people in a positive way because the skills we develop in sales are so transferable to any facet of life. Uh, but I ended up, uh, going into sales and combining that with uh, my development and also marketing skills. So I always say I'm a, a generalist. I'm not really good at anything, but can do a little bit of uh, all the startup skills. And um, I started dialing on the phone. Uh, I used to sell cold call property over the phone for four hours uh, after college every day. And um, Back then, we had the Nokias that were tiny on unlimited phone plans. So my fingers used to bleed because I'd dial so much. I had to put Band-Aids around my thumb so I could keep dialing. That's how aggressive I was to, to meet the goal, you know? Um, wow. Um, well, that's, that's uh, I mean, again, I, that's all we've got today for the show. Uh, <laughs> thank you so much. Cause, I mean, look, let's be, let's be honest. Um, that's an incredible story. There are so many things I want to get into and so, so little time, but, but I have to start here. What made you, uh, you know, there's a, there's a lot of, there's a lot of people who come on the show who say the word, I never thought I would get into sales. Yeah. Um, I would be one of those people, you know, I, I, I went, to, went to school in DC, I was studying international relations and foreign affairs, and I was working on the Obama campaign. And, you know, I, 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 I never dreamt that that meant that I would have a pathway into sales. Um, but, but you, you, you know, had an even more strong reason not to go to sales. Not only yeah. did you know what the world of sales was like, but your father kind of explicitly did not want you to do it. So then why, why did you do it? That's a really interesting point. And I think we share that. I found that I always had a stigma and, and felt the stigma, especially in Australia, that salespeople were not intelligent. Salespeople, going to sales was something you did when you couldn't do anything else. And then when I was about 19 or 20, I realized how this corporate game started to work where all my friends would apply for internships at big banks or the big four consulting companies. And then it would be a process where the 30, 35 year old people that I met in the MBA programs, all of them were still in that same ladder following step by step, even if they were perhaps better than their colleagues at their job. And I said, 
how the hell do I get out of this? And how do I get into a job where results do the talking? And that if I'm 20 and bring in eight times as much revenue as someone else, can that put me on the pathway to being a CEO or a leader of my own company? And so that's what inspired me to do sales is I saw it's the only profession in my mind where it's quite, it's a meritocracy. If you just do well, you go from here to here within a year to two years. I totally agree. I totally agree. And I think that that is a part of sales that is extremely appealing to many folks, myself included. You know, I, seeing what the world of politics was like and seeing that uh, it was just a giant rat race of who you know and how much ass kissing you could do where the people who had the best ideas and the people who wanted to create the most change were the people who were facing the most resistance while those people who played by the rules and and subscribe to to pork barrels and and subscribe to uh, cronyism would be the ones rewarded in the system and and that just completely didn't sit right with my immigrant background where all I saw was my parents work their ass off to go from being extremely poor to being uh, middle class and I thought to myself well sales offers an opportunity where I am my own boss and I am the keeper of my own paycheck um, and I think that it's very, it, the skill sets that I learned in sales have been really useful in building Bravado, not the least of which because it's a site for salespeople, but also because uh, you, there, you are your own boss, right? If I, if I wake up at six o'clock in the morning and work uh, really hard, it, there, no one's patting me on the back to say, good job, Sahil. But, but you do it because you know that that's the thing you have to do to be successful. And I think sales trains you to have an incredible work ethic. But, but there's a part of sales, and you mentioned the word stigma. There's, there's a part of sales that, if, I mean, we, we are talking about it in this, in this like fairly normal way. Most people think of salespeople and they think of untrustworthy, slimy, used car selling lemons to an old lady, uh, you know, grease balls, uh, unscrupulous, et cetera. Where does this stigma come from? And is it a fair stigma against the world of sales? I think <clears throat> sales is so deep and there's so many layers to what you can sell. And in that same way, selling a car versus complex enterprise software that's cloud dependent and highly technical those are two different things, but they both share the same profession label. When you fill out a job application or go for a loan, it'll say sales professional, right? So I think the stigma comes because there's such a, a, a wide gambit of different occupations or subgroups within sales. I think secondly, we, all, we always talk about, and especially in the Valley, there's a lot of move, movements to evangelize or elevate the profession they use that language but really if you look societally it's 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 still falling behind you have marketing as a subject at any tertiary institute i've ever been but sales ops rev ops uh sales techniques history of sales these are all great subjects that, that are really meaty and one of my personal goals is I don't want to do this forever. I think if I do do okay, I want to go back to university and, and structure some of this and, and make it something that people want to study and they want to learn because they're going to be doing it a hell of a lot more than a marketing minor when they're in many jobs um, outside of marketing specifically. Yeah. I, I think that's a really interesting point you build up, uh, bring up. You know, I had a conversation with um, uh, the uh, one of the the, the uh, career center executives um, at the University of San Francisco, and uh, she told me that um, the majority of seniors who come to her and and seek counsel on what profession they should get into, what jobs they should apply for, um, 
the majority of them want to work for a tech company, right? It's kind of the flavor of the thing in San Francisco. Um, and she looks at them and she says, are you technical? And if the answer is yes, she says, all right, go apply to be an engineer in a product or, you know, design or whatnot. If you're not technical, she says, okay, go apply to be an SDR or a salesperson. When she tells the technical people what they can do, they're super excited and motivated. When she tells the non-technical people what they can do, uh, the students, the, the, the soon-to-be graduates, um, the young women and the young men recoil against it and say, I didn't spend all this money. My parents didn't send me to college just for me to become a salesperson. Um, you know, uh, I'm a college graduate. Like, I did well in my class. I don't need to, like, I don't need to do sales as if it is a, a, a profession to be pitied or a profession to only fall into um, under, under uh, you know, with no other choice, right? Like, I'll do anything but sales. Um, and that's just all bullshit, right? All of it is just bullshit. Like, let's just be honest. Some of the most brilliant people that I have ever met have been individual salespeople, VPs of sales, CROs, et cetera. Um, and there is a number of studies that have been done on this, but there are more uh, CEOs of Fortune 500 companies that have a background in sales than any other departmental experience um, marketing, finance, technology, et cetera. Sales creates CEOs and creates great leaders. So maybe I'll ask the question just again, like why is there this stigma and why, why is sales considered to be a, a poor profession for someone to get into? Why is there no respect for the world of sales? Yeah, I think that one thing is that we don't do a good enough job of telling that story. I feel that if we were able to circulate those metrics into the tertiary institutions, if we were able to have sales movies where, you know, most of them didn't do cocaine and end up in prison, right? There, there needs to be some kind of positive sentiment around the profession and what I always draw the analogy, uh, my, my homeland is a country of criminals, Australia. It was, it was founded in 1788 and England sent all its best criminals uh, over there to go rot. And that's where half of my heritage comes from. But at the same time, there are a number of English people who said, hang on, let's move to Australia because there's a better life and we can cultivate the land and become farmers, right? But in order to become farmers, they had to do what? They had to step on a boat for nine months where 10% of them died from scurvy and other diseases. And in the same way, there's people who will love pure sales their whole life. But there's also a cohort of people who it's okay to see sales as a pathway because the skills are so transferable. And I feel that they're not cognizant of the fact that they need to step on this boat. They're too busy wor worried about being a top investment banker or a top VC or a top CEO, but they don't acknowledge that journey and the skills that are required because I tell you what, you step in a room with any one of those three examples I said, they're all selling to you whether they like it or not. And the ones that can't sell suck at their job. Um, and that's my response to that point again. I love it and i couldn't agree more you know i could not agree more and um it just just on this point um i i want to i want to make sure that i acknowledge that salespeople have done plenty ourselves we ourselves have done plenty to discredit our own profession i don't want to i don't want to sit here and and make it seem like the world looks at sales in in a poor way uh, because of external factors only. No, I, I think we are entirely culpable in our own reputation. Um, the, the shortcuts, the, the lying, the information, uh, you know, juggling of truth, um, misleading of prospects, um, you know, charging different prices to different people to get away with it. You know, I think that we have done a lot ourselves to, to earn uh, the reputation that we have of, of being um, untrustworthy. 
but I also think that the world is changing, you know, and, and, and your experience at Trust Radius, um, you know, is, is certainly proof of that. Um, perhaps you could share the story both of how we initially met, because I think it's such a fascinating one, your experience at Trust Radius and kind of where, where you see uh, the world of sales going in a, in a time and a place in which uh, salespeople no longer have the luxury of a information gap in order to uh, uh, strong arm a prospect into taking a call with them. Yeah, fantastic uh, question. So I had been a sales leader for almost two years or so before I moved to America and was again a sales leader. Uh, but when I decided to leave that company, I was very apprehensive about becoming a quota carrying rep again. And my trust radius position involved that. And I took the role there, not knowing if that would be positive or negative. But one other point to take from this podcast is any leader should get back in the saddle if they haven't done it for three to five years, at least if they can carry a small bag, everyone respects them for it. And I went into Trust Radius with a previous history of building Australia's biggest review site in restaurants and small businesses, the part of the founding team. And Trust Radius, for those who don't know, is a site where people who are uh, investigating B2B software will use a site like this to read what other users say and help uh, use that knowledge to inform their purchasing decision. And the role was amazing because there were several phenomena that I felt. Uh, the first was that people don't, don't want to talk to salespeople even more than ever, I feel, because they're used to buying products now where they can do everything themselves. They have a free trial. They also can use sites like Trust Radius, but you know, Yelp uh, for restaurants or Glassdoor where you were for jobs. And so there's really a strange buying atmosphere the third thing was that all vendors, like, God, how many of you who click on this out of LinkedIn would probably agree it's all the same crap, excuse the French, but every vendor's saying that they're number one on this and they all put out some bland white paper that's about the same stuff that no one wants to read. So it's super hard to differentiate yourself in the sale when everyone's doing exactly the same thing. And so that was the milieu, the, the kind of theme that was, was really present and palpable in that last role. So I think, um, you know, when you, when you talk about people, uh, buyers uh, changing habits, and you mentioned that today we're able to buy everything online and, you know, we have Amazon reviews and then we buy our, you know, scale or our, our lamp or whatever we're buying or, you know, you, you, you're able to uh, go onto Glassdoor and read about five different companies and then decide which one to work for. You're able to go on to TripAdvisor and read reviews of hotels or Yelp and read reviews of restaurants or et cetera, et cetera. Um, that, I think, is both true and false to some extent. And, and where I think it's true is certainly that, you know, this is, this is the world in which we live. But, but, but let's be honest, right? Uh, most restaurants on Yelp have a between a three to four star rating. I think something around 70% of restaurants or 75% of restaurants on Yelp have between three and three, either three, three and a half or four star reviews. Uh, the average restaurant that I see on Yelp has like 100 to 200 reviews. I read two of them, maybe three. I mostly just look at the pictures. Um, you know, there is this corpus of data that is being built up, which is that, you know, here's hundreds of, of, of experiences that diners have had. But distilling that information and being able to decode which one is right for me is still very difficult, you know, like for, and, and, and in a lot of instances, beauty is in the eye of the, of the beholder. And, and so you have uh, 20 people who go to a restaurant, three of them find it too spicy, five of them find it too bland, 10 of them find it okay. And, you know, seven of them find it delicious. What, what does that mean? Right? Like, and so synthesizing experiences 
it is still really difficult. And if you've ever tried to buy a product on, on Amazon and seen, you know, a product that has 4,000 reviews and, and a 4.7 rating and another competitive product that has 2,600 reviews and a 4.6 rating and you read some of the reviews and it's all kind of the same, it's not that easy to actually distinguish uh, which product I should buy or not buy. And so I end up doing a second level search where I'm just looking for like a curated review of some sort, right? Someone who's like, I've tested these three products and let me show you, you know, like one of those articles from like Thrillist or 7 by 7 or some other site like that. Um, and, and so I guess the point that I'm trying to make is um, I think reviews are really powerful. Uh, but being able to personalize the content that you're seeing to apply to you as, as, as in your case is really important. And I don't know that we've done the best job of, of getting there yet. I don't know if you would agree or disagree with that. I'm, I'm curious. Yeah, this is a rat hole for me because then I start getting angry about account-based marketing and all this stuff. Uh, so one thing I'll, I'll just comment on some trends. For instance, we talk about account-based relevance and going after people at uh, correct companies and, and personas. But the problem is, as you've said, even if you know who you're going after, how do you make content that's relevant to them? Because if you're able to share those stories and insights closer to when they enter your funnel, then you're going to seem more relevant than the brands uh, using generic uh, examples. And I feel that these review sites are super good they're like a treasure trove of data that's waiting to be untapped because as marketers and salespeople start to realize how you can apply this, it's going to augment the way things are. I think there's a couple of things we're seeing. We're seeing that these sites are now serving you content based on your Facebook uh, login or your LinkedIn login, which if you look at reference selling, it's so much more powerful if someone said, hey, so Hill said X about this product and that, that recommends that content based on our relationship, I'm going to want to read that a hundred times more. And an example of that was uh, Dan Murphy. Shout out to you, my Australian friend. Dan just got in touch with me the other day. He's like, oh, I didn't know you used Pipedrive. I read your review the other day. It got served to me. And I'm like, that's exactly the kind of uh, correct use of that material. Uh, final point is that the usage of reviews and these external proof points is infused in the buyer's journey. There's the top level impression. So you want to show that there's a critical mass of feedback. But when you mid stage, as you said, you want to actually select or hand select some examples that truly speak to what you're trying to solve. And then at the end, let's think about this is rarely, a, you know, in, in our cases where the decision makers probably in our firms, but in the firms we sell to, there's unknown decision makers. At the end of the journey at contract stage, that's when they're checking these review sites anyway, just for that final tick. So it's the, the story uh, is quite extensive now with how customers are using all this, in my opinion. I would agree with everything that you said um, because I think, you know, and, and, and especially on that note about personalized content, you know, I think that that's, that's so important. It's so important um, to be able to uh, serve uh, uh, review, whether it's reviews or it's content uh, that is uh, socially proofed by your network. And I think that that is an increasingly uh, more powerful uh, and more important use case. Um, you know, one of the things that we grapple with at Bravado uh, on, a, on a regular basis is, you know, salespeople are coming in and they're getting testimonials from their customers. They're, they're building positive brand reputations for themselves. As uh, buyers, as their prospects come to visit their Bravado page and they're, and they're starting to read those reviews from their customers and try to understand, hey, is this a salesperson I want to work with? Is this, is this somebody I can trust? How do we make that information more and more contextually relevant? How do we, how do we make sure that if, if I'm the salesperson and you're my prospect and, and let's say that you know, our mutual contact, Jill, uh, wrote me a testimonial 
how do I make sure that when you come to the Bravado site that you see Jill's review first? You know, this is something that we, we grapple with and, and we think about all the time. I think that what makes that really interesting in particular, though, is that it may not be the relationship you have with somebody that, that governs whether uh, you trust the review or not. It might be the fact that they're in the same shoes as you, right? Like, so you mentioned being the the, you know, you're currently running uh, sales at GetAccept, you know, if somebody who is, it, it doesn't even need to be a direct competitor, but if there's a company that does something similar to GetAccept and they have a VP of sales that commented on a product, and maybe you don't even know this person, um, but but if he or she commented on, on, a, on the product and then you see that, that's going to be really influential to you because you're going to say, well, wait a minute, if this person's finding value in it, and I know that what they do is very similar to what I do, then, then maybe, you know, I should also pay attention to this. So I think that relevance has a, a number of dimensions to it and trying to unlock in which order you should show relevance, I think is something that we, we think about on a regular basis. Definitely. Um, I'm also thinking as we're talking, we didn't even touch on uh, how, how we met or why I think it's important that people consider Bravado. Not that it's a direct plug, but I think it's relevant, <laughs> right? Um, Thank you. I appreciate it. <laughs> but uh, plug time, everyone. But I actually, so to be transparent, I don't use Bravado yet um, and I, I probably will. So that is also shows that this is an authentic statement. Um, but how we came in into uh, friends is I saw someone that I was speaking to uh, you know, who's a, a mutual uh, friend, um, mentioned Bravado early on in the piece. And when I logged into the site, I, I also was a little bit saddened because I had an idea similar to Bravado as I was working at Trust Radius. I was never going to do it because I'm so busy and I'm not taking the risk to be a founder again uh, for another couple of years. Um, but what I found was that no one trusted or believed me as a salesperson for one. Secondly, I wanted to be able to get testimony in a way that was, uh, so to set the scene, right now when you ask companies to go on the record, these review sites are great because there's not the conventional PR channel that you have to deal with because you can circumvent that. But what happens if I wanted to get testimony from someone who didn't proceed with me, or maybe there's other circumstances, but I could still use that logo and that positivity to go after their competitors and to use that to my, uh, to further my career. And that's where I really saw this kind of helping. And the, the final area is that I do all these deals and do all this work, but if I was fired tomorrow and uh, I had nothing, no one would ever believe it unless I was really, really thorough with references and laying that out. So with that in mind, when I saw what you guys have done, I was like, this is a no brainer for any sales person. Uh, you've got to proceed down this path because if you leverage it properly, there's, there's so much uh, positive externality to be gained from, from doing it. Well, first of all, I, I appreciate uh, very much your kind words. You know, we, we have never actually discussed bravado on any other future of sales episode. And, and, and the purpose of this podcast is, is certainly uh, not uh, to, to plug the, the bravado product. But, but in your particular case, yeah. I think it is so relevant because you had the experience at Trust Radius of, of B2B buyers and, and getting reviews and, and obviously your background and your experience in Australia and working with reviews, you know, obviously my experience at Glassdoor around reviews. And so I think we've, we've just touched on this topic, you know, in so many different ways. Something that you just said, though, which I, you know, it, and it saddens me a bit to hear this, but, but is also just a reality. You know, you say nobody trusts or believes a salesperson. And, and that's just true, right? Yeah. Objectively, that is true. Uh, if, you know, you walk into a room and you say, hey, I'm a salesperson, you lose credibility, you don't gain it, right? If you walk into a room and say, I'm a doctor, people respect your opinion on medicine. If you walk into the room and say, exactly. hey, and I say, I'm a mechanic, people respect your opinion when it comes to auto, you know, an automotive mechanic. And now people want to ask you questions about their cars. 
you walk in and say I'm a tech salesperson, no one wants to talk tech with you, right? They're like, oh, this person's going to try to scam me or something. And I, and I, and I just think that that, and we're back to the stigma conversation in a way. And, and I think that this conversation is, is kind of all nutshelled together by, by this, which is, you know, the mission that we're, that we have, which, which is not just ours, by the way, there are many fantastic companies that are, that are trying to do very, very similar things. And we, and we are but a, a speck in, in that ecosystem. Uh, but, but the mission is, you know, eliminate the stigma around sales, give respect to the, to the profession of sales and, and champion salespeople and, and have a way for them to be believed and be trusted. Um, is it possible? Is that, is that even, I mean, forget about bravado and in, 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 in just ourselves, but just it, as a whole, is it possible that sales will ever not have a stigma? Mm, it's an interesting point. I'd say that let's take the, the general sample of people in say business to business. And I don't care what you say. I, I call bullshit if you disagree with me on this point. Some people go, because they go, do you hate salespeople? And they go, oh, no, I don't. And you can tell they're lying. Most, generally, everyone hates salespeople. Even I hate salespeople at times when they're bad, right? But in the same way, the guy who sold me my TV back home in Australia, who I love, he was a legend for recommending I got a particular feature that, that I used every day to record back when there wasn't, you know, the recording boxes. And it, it changed my life. I could watch the football uh, after I came back from the gym. And I went and saw that guy for every technique that I needed. So people hate salespeople up until the point that they actually get something from them. And at times, then they actually go on to love the salespeople more than anyone because the salesperson is akin to a doctor or a fitness trainer or someone who could change the way you do things. And so one thing I'd like to introduce in this podcast is often I, I call it the Mary Poppins analogy, uh, but in that show, you know, she says a spoonful of sugar helps the medicine go down. And often even if we're hated or not, I think the issue is not, you know, we're talking about the stigma and we should do positive things to change that. And we will, but even if we can't change it, what's more important is that we're biting the bullet as sales professionals and saying, you know what, if this customer really exhibits characteristics that, that are conducive to me being able to help them, I don't mind giving them the sugar. I don't mind, giving them something that they may not really like the process and getting sold to right at the start. But when those benefits sink in and when that medicine does its job, they'll come back and give you a hug and say, thank you for doing that. So my point is the sales process can be tough. The, pro the prospect might say, not now, not now. I don't want to do it. But if it's in the right case and you elevate and you do actually encourage them to proceed, Sometimes that's in both of your interests to do it. So it's don't be afraid to embrace that is, is one of the key messages in my mind. Yeah, I uh, just, I mean, I, you know, I, I, I couldn't agree with you more. You know, when, when, you, when you describe the relationship that uh, customers build with salespeople that they know and trust and love, um, some of my dearest friends, people who came to my wedding, people whose weddings and at the birth of whose kids and their kids' birthday parties that I have been to have been customers of mine, right? Have been people that were actively trying to avoid to ever talking to me um, and, and ignored countless emails and calls from me until uh, in, in some unfortunate moment of their lives, in some moment of weakness, I was able to seize just a moment of their attention. And, and from it, we were able to bring and build a, a relationship um, that, that has in, in some cases uh, spanned decades, not just years, not just months. Um, and so I think that, uh, you know, it is, it is, it is what you're saying is true, which is that, um, you know, if you can break through the noise and really build an authentic relationship with somebody, um, it, you lose the stigma of I am a salesperson, you are a buyer, we are in the sales and buying process, and you all of a sudden become two people on a journey together. And I think, you know, th that that's 
the experience that we all kind of covet and dream of on both sides of that aisle. Yeah, that the marriage aisle. <laughs> that's right. That's right. That's right. Um, so I want to I want to end by by just asking you one more question. I mean, the we 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 named this podcast the future of sales um, for for two reasons. You know, one one was uh, you know we we wanted very much to have um, a dialogue about that which is to come, not that which has been, because we feel like there's a lot of conversation especially on LinkedIn, as you mentioned, from, from talking heads, describing all of the tactics that you need to do in order to break through in sales today, the vast majority of which are bullshit. And, and then, I mean, just to be honest, and, and then secondly, uh, you have, uh, and the other main reason that we, that we really focus on the name of the future of sales is because you know, none of us, all of us have opinions and ideas, but none of us know for sure what exactly is going to happen to the profession. I mean, there's cries of like the bots are coming and they're going to steal all the jobs. And in two years, there'll be no more SDRs. And, you know, or, you know, I, I mean, I hear, I hear all sorts of theories. What's yours? Where, where you know, let's say like today, um, you know, we're sitting here in April of, of 2018 let's fast forward, it's April of 2021 or 2022, you know, three, four years have gone by. Uh, break out your crystal ball, go visit the Oracle at Delphi. You can, you can use the analog that you prefer. Where, <laughs> what, what is going to happen in the future of sales, Dalius? I'm putting you on the record. Well, I'll you guys, uh, you guys haven't got the privilege to hear my ghost telling stories yet where um, I have premonitions about the future and things, but uh they, ever since I've drink, had all this fluoridated water over here, I think I'm getting less and less of these premonitions. Um, but or maybe it's whatever was in the water and nothing. Yeah, it's yeah. Crazy, perhaps. But anyway, I'll digress. Um, so if you want those stories, uh, you can ask me in the comments or we do a follow-up and I'll, I'll tell some of them. I think that the, the future, so there's many elements. I think the first thing is enterprise is still as dirty and has so many moving parts as it always has, even though we talk about the cloud, because the cloud allows you to do so many more things that are integrated, that creates its own mess. And so I feel like the enterprise is gonna be safe for salespeople for a long time to come. I, I don't see much change there. And people who write that stuff just wanna get clicks and, and keep their jobs. On the lower end, I think that let's, if we talk about self-service software or things that, that are more transactional, uh, I think there is change between, uh, it's more from people doing outbound selling and uh, because it's very expensive to have a person on the phone and doing emails all the time to potentially less qualified people helping them more proactively through support as they're in that self-service journey. And so my feeling is that you see chatbots and AI and a lot of chat about a lot of talk about this augmenting that experience when you're using a, a product. I think that will help, uh, but I all I think that people will become a lot more support orientated inside those products versus actually putting people through buyer journeys for small ACVs. I don't think I think that will dilute. Um, in terms of outreach, the final thing I wanted to mention in this futuristic point is that the rate of success of email is falling. And I, this is just something that I've seen for years and, it, and it's just a curve that just keeps going like that. At the same time, it's just like uh, talking to a man or a woman at a bar. A lot of people do it. But if you do it in a good way and you're wearing a, something that stands out, it's easier than ever. So in an age of terrible email uh, output and in declining consumption of that output, there's still lots of room to be the holy grail. But I think we're going to see a privatized channel of communication develop where things like Slack, but maybe something else, an email 2.0 that I'm not smart enough to think about, where it'll be very centric on that internal company and 
companies will be reaching out to brands they want to work with a lot more and it'll be harder for us to get in through that digital method. So then events and these other things are going to be the ways that we need to break into those bigger businesses for, for my mind. Um, but you asked a tough question. If I'm right about any of this stuff, I should get a payment from you in 2021. Hey, <laughs> <laughs> it, it depends if I still have a job. Um, and so if I still have the means to pay you and, Heaven knows I'll be paying you in some cryptocurrency. Yeah. Probably, won't be, probably won't be Bitcoin or Ethereum. It'll be something we've never heard of and, and, and we'll go from there. But uh, if, I, if, if anybody knows which one it is, feel free to message me privately. Um, and so, uh, you know, I, Dahlia, thank you so much for your time. I, I, wanna, I wanna say just to that last point that you made, which I, which I you know, really enjoyed um, hearing, hearing your thoughts on uh, as I'm sure all of our uh, viewers did as well, um, you know, when you're when you're talking about the enterprise um, and you're talking about people buying, uh, you know, products uh, versus the the uh, smaller ACVs. Look, you know, we've we have successfully as a as a as a population eliminated the need to go to Toys R Us. I know this because they're shutting down. We've I eliminated the. Uh, I mean, you know, the, the giraffe, Jeffrey the giraffe was part of my childhood. Man. I love that. And I used to, I go in there and throw the fake basketballs around for a bit of fun before a movie. And then I used to go into the movie, even oh, at man. 20 years old. <laughs> <laughs> it's because you weren't buying the basketballs. That was the problem. <laughs> yeah, that's the um, problem. And, that's how they yeah. shut down. Yeah, maybe they just should have charged you a couple bucks to come and play in there, like a Timberee for teenagers and young adults. Anywho, so, so, so look, I mean, you know, we have successfully uh, gotten rid of the need to go to Radio Shack or Circuit City and, uh, you know, with any luck, Best Buy as soon as well. And, 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 so, and so where does that leave us, though? Um, have we gotten rid of car dealerships yet? No, you know, we haven't gotten rid of car dealerships yet. We've had car and driver magazine and we've had reviews on cars and we've had all of these things. And yet startups like BP, um, which have raised hundreds of millions of dollars have crashed and burned and failed uh, because people are scared to buy a car online that they've never seen. And, and they're scared to, to make a purchase for 40, 50, a hundred thousand dollars without like going to the dealership and asking that human being, the, the, the human on the other end, a bunch of nuanced questions, some sophisticated, some not so, that, that give you a measure of trust and comfort. And I think that that's not to say that people don't research cars online, of course they do, but it is to say that it is just part of the step and that the human interaction is a massive part of that step as well. And I think that that it remains true for uh, technology as well. Um, you know, the vast majority of technology buyers are not technical. Um, you know, if you're buying Workday or Success Factors and you're the head of HR at a company, odds are at least somewhat decent that you can't code and you don't understand the nuance of what makes one of these products better or worse than the other save for the experience that you've had on the front end using the product and then the recommendations of your peers and then, you know, maybe some marketing materials or whatnot. And so without being able to, uh, you know, fundamentally understand the product um, at its, at its kind of bite level, you need that human being that you can trust and talk to and, and can give you comfort and confidence in your decision. I think that that's not going away. And, and I think that the human, um, I think that the future of sales um, is is one in which the salesperson is more like a project or product uh, is more like a project manager than they are a salesperson. They're they're more technical. They're more they're more um, aligned to the interest of the buyer than ever before. Uh, you know, do I think that the days of commissioned salespeople might be coming to an end potentially? Do I think that the concept of territories might come to an end one day potentially? I think that there's a lot of systems that we've built that are very self-serving on the vendor side, but that don't have any benefit to the, to the buyer, to the customer. And so I, I believe that there are a lot of things that will change, but, but one thing that will never change is that if you are somebody who is uh, a, a trustworthy, someone who is an expert in your field, 
and somebody who inspires confidence and trust from your buyers, then you will have a job and you will be valued in, in, in your place in the tech ecosystem. That, that, that's just my opinion. Yeah, I agree with that. And, and the final thought is when you have machines, I, if you want to know what it's like to be marketed to by machine, go to sleep on a cold night and put your Apple iMac on your, on your leg. Because that, that feeling that you get of the cold metal against your skin is how a buyer feels when they're being marketed to automatically. It, it sucks. And it's artificial and cold. So humans add the flavor. And just like we saw in, say, the, I'd say, 96 to 2002, where everyone outsourced their call centers to India and the Philippines and other countries, you saw in UK, US and Australia, an emergence with companies who promised to have their call centers local got an up, up spike in business. So in the same way, some of the firms that keep the humans in the seats, uh, even if you have a really good bot, there'll be people who'll start to say, oh, are you, are you a bot or a human? And they might give preference to the brands that are actually investing money in that, in that approach, I, I feel too. But it's exciting times ahead and um, who knows, mate, we could be blown to smithereens by many enemies on this West Coast. So I hopefully we get there, um, but I'm optimistic. <laughs> I'm optimistic too, man. I'm optimistic too. And, uh, and, and uh, you know, we, we have to have you back on. I feel like we could spend hours and hours and hours doing this. And every time I talk to you, I, I feel much more the same. I, I think all of our viewers and our listeners are going to get so much from this conversation um, thanks to your wisdom and, and, and transparency and willingness to share. Uh, Dalius, thank you so much for the time, sir. Uh, I, I wish you a, a wonderful uh, rest of your day. And uh, we'll, we'll look forward to the next time that we can, uh, we can steal you for a few minutes on the future of sales. And be proud, sellers. Be strong and proud and have uh, comfort that you're doing a good thing in a good line of work. I love it, man. You heard it from you heard it from the man himself. All right, Dahlia, thank you very much. Uh, that wraps another episode of the Future of Sales, and uh, thank you very much. <laughs>